All right, so the next speaker is Aileen Garriepi. Is that pronounced? Uh, Garriepi. Garriepi. I like Garriepi. Okay, Garriepi. Um, she's an assistant professor in OBGYN and reproductive sciences, and she's going to talk to us about the setting of contraception um, in cancer, uh, women who have cancer. I have a little belt. So just a little bit of a different topic, I guess. Um, so it's uh, wonderful to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I am an obstetrician gynecologist recruited to Yale two years ago to help start a section of family planning. Um, and hopefully by the end of this talk, you will see um, why I'm here and um, what I think is important and how I think we could partner together to take care of patients. Um, so I'd like to talk about the epidemiology of pregnancy risk and pregnancy prevention in women with cancer, empower you who are treating women with cancer to talk about contraception, and then also talk about some recent evidence-based guidelines for contraception in women with cancer. Um, I just wanted to start by talking about unintended pregnancy in the United States in general. So um, again, uh, just a little bit of a different topic than our previous um, discussant. Um, there's a lot of sex happening, so I hope that doesn't make anyone here feel bad. <laughs> um, but when you look at the statistics, it's definitely true that people are having sex, and as I tell my friends and family all the time, if you're having sex and you're not using contraception, you are in fact trying to get pregnant. Um, so unintended pregnancy in the United States is appallingly high. We have not, we, like meaning me, have not done a good job um, of helping women with this. And so when you look at all pregnancies in the United States, which is approximately six million per year, approximately half are unintended. Um, and then of the unintended, um, about 22% of those um, women will choose to give birth, 20% will end in abortion, and 7% will end in miscarriage. Looking at that category of unintended pregnancy a little bit further, um, about half of those are due to unintended, um, are mistimed, so they're occurring earlier. Someone wanted to eventually get pregnant in the future, but maybe at age like 15 when they're in the middle of their leukemia uh, treatment was not what they intended, um, versus unintended, unwanted in women who have already um, finished having their children. So, you know, somebody who's 47 with breast cancer and has three beautiful children and didn't want to have any more children and, oops, finds out that... Um, that she is pregnant. If you look at a woman's reproductive um, lifetime nationally, the mean age of um, coitarch or coitarchy, which is when um, young women start having sex, is 17. And so if a woman is heterosexually active from the age of 17 to 44 and she wants two children, she will spend approximately 30 years of her life trying to avoid pregnancy. Like longer than you've been in school, longer than we do most anything else, women on average will spend 30 years trying not to get pregnant. And that's why unintended pregnancy um, and subsequently abortion are common in the United States. One in two women has experienced an unintended pregnancy at some point in her life. And it's definitely true, and maybe for some of you in the audience, that unintended doesn't all, um, necessarily mean that it's bad. We might have some verily, happily welcomed oops babies in the audience. Um, and that, you know, we've got some in my family too. <laughs> Um, and we also know that one in three women will, some point, will have an abortion at some point in their life for a variety of reasons. So of the annual three million, un, um, three million unintended pregnancies in the United States, half are in women who are already using contraception. This again tells me that I am not doing a good job. Um, one of the reasons for that is method failure, and then the other is imperfect use, and we're gonna talk about both of those. And then half are in women who are not using a method. Um, but who do not want to be pregnant. And so this, in my practice, is who I see the, you know, the diabetic hypertensive that was told she had to stop taking her birth control pills, but she shouldn't get pregnant, which then means she's relying on the, most, uh, the least effective method of contraception, which is like prayer, hope, and denial, and they are not very good at all. Um, when we look at what women in the United States do use for birth control, um, 
Overwhelmingly, sterilization is the most common when you break it down in terms of um, women under the age of 35. OC is oral contraceptive pill, is the second most common. Then the male condom, IUDs, withdrawal where the man uh, pulls out before he ejaculates. Um, the injectable, which is really Depo Provera. Um, ring, did anybody see Saturday Night Live on Saturday? Yes, the bling, the Nuva, Nuva bling. If you didn't see it, Google it, it's awesome. Um, and then other non-hormonal contraceptive and other hormonal. So I think one of the most important messages today and the one that is my uh, public service announcement at all family gatherings or high school reunions or anything that anyone <laughs> invites me to, sorry if you're behind me in line at Dunkin' Donuts, is that um, <laughs> not all contraception is created equally. And again, I think this is really important and we haven't done a good job of getting this message out. This is a, a, a table um, which is incredibly graphic, especially if you look at the pictorial for withdrawal, and that is because, um, I apologize, but this was created by the World Health Organization to be used in developing countries where um, the rates of illiteracy are very high. And so if a picture does not in fact tell the story and someone is illiterate, then it's not helpful. But the residents are always like, is that what I think it is? And I'm sorry, and let's just move on. So um, when we talk about birth control, there's really four levels of birth control based on how effective they are. And that's really how we should be thinking about, talking about, and, and counseling women. Um, and I think you could even collapse tier three and four. So condoms, the diaphragm, um, fertility awareness methods, which is natural family planning or trying to abstain from sex around the time you think you might be fertile, withdrawal, spermicides, a 20 to 30% chance of getting pregnant in the first year of use. Right, like the package says, you know, condoms are 98% effective. In actuality, it's 20, 20 to 30% failure rate. So the middle of the road is the pill, the patch, the ring, the injectables, and that's lactational amenorrhea. So they have about a 20% failure rate over the course of a year. And then the most effective, what I like to think of as like the champagne of birth control, because I like champagne, is uh, the implants and the IUDs, which are just as good as sterilization, uh, but they're also 100% reversible, less than a 1% failure rate. So when you look at what young women are using the most, going back to that previous slide, it's um, OCPs, which is in the, the middle category, and also um, condoms, which are in the lowest category. And so we look as we look at trying to decrease rates of unintended pregnancy in the United States, we look at how to get um, help more women choose contraception that lines up with their needs, which is to not get pregnant, and that's methods in that top tier, which are also called um, the IUDs and the implants, are also called LARC methods for long-acting, reversible contraception. So I think the important thing um, of this is that the typical use rate is did not, does not equal the perfect use rate, so the um, condoms being 99% effective, that's the perfect use rate, that's in clinical studies where we're paying people to use condoms and tell us and, you know, they have a nurse and who's awesome and is kind of counseling them, but when we survey and look at people who report using condoms as birth control methods, which is the typical use rate, um, that's where you get the failure rate of 20 to 30 percent. And so the perfect use rate is irrelevant because no one lives in a perfect world. That if we're going to really help men and women prevent pregnancy with them they don't want to be pregnant, then we need to talk about what's typical. So this is a categorization of um, all the kinds of methods of contraception, and I think what um, you know, looking at this top tier, you see ideal and typical rates that are the same, um, or perfect and typical rates that are the same, the failure rate, versus depo, the pill patch, the ring, there's a much higher failure rate in the typical, and the same for all, the, all of the methods that are in the tier uh, three and four. So we're gonna concentrate on tier one and how this is applicable to women who are cancer survivors or currently undergoing cancer therapy. Um, I just want to briefly talk about those most common methods, the pro, or the, the top one, the top tier methods, the LARC methods. So there's a progestin implant, the, the trade name is Implanon or Nexplanon. It's a very small rod about the size of a matchstick that goes in the arm between the biceps and the triceps, right underneath the skin. It's meant to be palpable, then she knows that she's protected and that makes it easier to get out for those of you who lived through the horror of the Norplant years, which was hard to get out. Um, it inhibits ovulation for three years. It has one of the lowest um, risk rates of pregnancy. Um, and then the main side effect, it's not that it's unhealthy or unsafe, but it is incredibly annoying for some people, is unpredictable bleeding. 
Um, the IUD, IUDs, there's two different kinds. There's a copper only and then a progestin only method. Um, they basically block or kill sperm and eggs. They're just as effective as getting tubes tied. Um, women overall are ve very satisfied with them. Um, it's quick to insert it and they also have a rapid return to fertility. So the top is the copper IUD and the bottom is the progestin only and the progestin that's in it is levonorgestrel. The copper IUD is, is uh, brand name is Paragard. It releases copper ions. Again, it uh, reduces motility and viability of sperm. It inhibits development of the ova. It's approved for 10 years of use. It could probably be used for 12, but it hasn't gotten FDA approval for that. Another advantage is that it could be used as emergency contraception. So if someone's had unprotected sex in the last five days, call me. Um, then you could use it as emergency contraception and ongoing contraceptions. Um, and then the disadvantages are that it can um, cause menses to be heavier, longer, and crampier, which we'll talk about in the cancer patient. The levonorgestrel IUD releases a small amount of progestin. So this is a local release of progestin. It has the lowest systemic levels of progestin of all the forms of birth control. It's approved for five years of use. The progestin causes the cervical mucus to thicken, which then acts as a physical barrier to sperm. It's highly effective, and it also has menstrual benefits. Um, there's about 20% amenorrhea after one year, which most women really like, but you need to um, give anticipatory guidelines so that they don't think that's a problem. I think for, um, for people who, who were practicing medicine in the 70s and 80s and, and, and the 90s and the aughts, <laughs> um, there was a big concern about IUDs causing PID. And um, the best study, um, which looked at 20,000 women, showed that there is a slightly increased rate of PID in the first um, 20 days of use, which probably has to do with not screening for gonorrhea and chlamydia and kind of a transient bacteremia that might happen with introduction of the IUD. But once you're outside of that 21 days, um, that there's really not a, a clinically significant increased risk of getting PID with an IUD. We were also used to be concerned about IUDs and whether or not they caused infertility. And the best study that looked at this showed that it's not the IUD that causes infertility, it's the previous history of chlamydia that women didn't know that they had been infected with. So when they tested for chlamydial antibodies, which is objective proof of having a previous um, uh, infection with chlamydia, that that is what is associated with infertility not w and that the IUD was not the, the culprit. So I think this is a great resource that I'm, I'm happy to share with you today. This is the US medical eligibility criteria for contraceptive use. It's available online. Um, and basically it's an evidence-based guideline that goes through every method of contraception um, matched up with different characteristics of women um, and including complex medical conditions. The criteria are organized um, according to the method, patient characteristics, any pre-existing conditions, um, and then it gives recommendations for contraception. So this is the color-coded um, um, nomenclature. So green, good, pink, not so good, red, don't do it. And as you can see, for most contraceptives, for most medical conditions, most is green. When you look at LARC use, again, the implant and the IUDs with some medical conditions, um, the most the safest thing for women to use are the LARC methods. So if you look at controlled hypertension, everything is a one. So that is um, benefits far outweigh risk. If you look at multiple cardi cardiovascular risk factors, uh, history of an MI, hyperlipidemia, um, ones and twos. History of DVT, PE, thrombogenic mutations, um, all twos, DVT, PE, stroke. So again, LARC methods are safe in general for women with complex um, medical histories. Breast cancer, um, so a copper IUD is a one, and someone with current breast cancer, the levonorgestrel IUS and the implant, which are the progestin-only contraceptives, are four, and we're gonna talk about that. The other thing that they think is important when you talk about contraception and any risks that um, contraception brings is compared to what? So contraception is to prevent pregnancy. And we know that pregnancy is actually one of the riskiest times for a woman. So your chances of getting a clot are predominant are much higher during pregnancy than they are with any use of a contraceptive. And so the CDC um, medical eligibility criteria is also making their recommendations based on what the risk of pregnancy would bring to that woman with those coexisting medical conditions. Um, and so these are some of the conditions relevant to this audience um, that are associated with an increased risk for adverse health events during pregnancy. 
breast cancer, liver cancer, um, GTD, gestational trophoblastic disease, um, the other female cancers, endometrial, ovarian, lupus, sickle cell, um, and HIV AIDS. So again, knowing that these are safe, knowing that these are the women who are at high risk, highest risk of complications during pregnancy, there is a good overlap, thank goodness, with um, what women's needs are and what we have available to them, which, is, which are these methods of long-acting reversible contraception, which are also the most effective. When you look at the risks of what, um, the risks of uh, morbidity and mortality with um, contraceptives, this is a comparison with other um, common common occurrences. So for OCPs, in general, your chance of death in one year is incredibly low, unless you're a smoker, um, a heavy smoker, and usually over the age of 35. The IUD um, chance of death is 0.01, none. Fertility awareness-based methods, laparoscopic sterilization, because it is general anesthesia, and we do put generally a, a sharp trocar through your abdomen, um, so the risk is a little bit higher. But pregnancy, 11.5, again, your risk of having, um, of dying is much higher during pregnancy than it is using any kind of, of contraception. And of course, when that is compared to driving, um, you know, it really pales in comparison. The reproductive relative risks, again, using hormonal contraception versus laparoscopic sterilization, which is permanent and irreversible and surgical, that the risks of dying are much less than um, with, with getting pregnant and continuing the pregnancy and giving birth. So I think the big picture here is that all contraception is safer than pregnancy. But what about for women with cancer? Um, I'd like to share with you today the gu recent guidelines from the Society of Family Planning. So this is a relatively new in the history of medicine kind of academic association of researchers, clinicians, and ed educators dedicated to improving sexual and reproductive health for women in the United States and abroad. Um, and we do um, a lot of research. We issue a lot of evidence-based guidelines and generally try to be helpful um, for women who don't want to be pregnant. We want to help them. Um, so this is the clinical guidelines that I'm going to be going over today. You could also find them online. The website is there. Um, prevalence in the, each year in the United States, there's an estimated 740,000 women who are diagnosed with cancer. Um, and the number of cancer survivors is likely to grow because you guys are doing an amazing job. Um, the reproductive needs, unfortunately, what little data we do have with this is not necessarily reassuring because cancer survivors um, report that their reproductive health needs um, are not generally met. And they've found, been found to have limited awareness of available contraceptives. And this probably has to do with the fact that if they're, when we get a cancer diagnosis, we um, often um, stop seeing of some of our other primary care providers, including obstetricians, gynecologists. And the discussions that need to happen um, about cancer prognosis, treatment, and side effects may not, there may not be enough time and they may not be seeing the appropriate practitioners to be able to talk about contraceptive needs. There's also a limited awareness of contraceptive options. Um, and that also may be um, for some of our health healthcare providers as well. And then I think the other issue that's complicating this for cancer survivors is whether, to, whether or not um, figuring out whether or not a patient is fertile. Um, because an absence of menses in someone with a history of cancer does not necessarily mean that she can't get pregnant. And there's been pregnancy reported in cancer survivors who are amenorrheic, not getting a menses, and who have FSH levels that are consistent with menopause. So by those two clinical criteria, you would think that they are infertile. But there's kind of a perimenopausal um, transient infertility that could happen with cancer patients. And so she could be not, you know, not ovulating for two to three months until she does on month four. Um, and unintended pregnancy is really not the way that most women want to learn that they're still fertile. Um, and then identification of women um, who are fertile in after chemotherapy is still an active area of research. I think that, um, that unintended pregnancy in cancer survivors is incredibly important. We don't have great population-based data on the prevalence of it, but we do have some small studies that looked at what ca uh, female cancer survivors, survivors who became pregnant um, chose to do as far as uh, pregnancy outcomes. And in the United States, um, in a small study that looked at cancer survivors aged 15 to 30, they were much more likely to terminate a pregnancy than age match controls. And while abortion is absolutely safe, and I, um, as an abortion provider, have no, um, no problems with giving that health care to women, I can tell you that it's an incredibly difficult decision for women. And I'd much rather that they never have to make it in the first place. 
Um, and there's also some recent literature from, um, from, the, from the Danish literature that found that cancer survivors were slightly more likely to terminate a pregnancy than their sisters or population-based controls. Again, showing us that there is a group of women who are having an unmet need um, so that they want, don't want to be pregnant, but they are getting pregnant. I think this is really uh, a critical issue for women with cancer because pregnancy can interfere with our ability to accurately diagnose and stage a cancer. It can um, interfere with the options and timing of treatment. And then the flip side of that is that the cancer diagnosis and treatment can interfere with the pregnancy. Um, so for someone who eventually does want to have more children to um, be diagnosed with pregnancy in the middle of a radiation therapy or chemotherapy and having to make the decision of whether to dial down her treatment or at what stage of the pregnancy, again, I think is a really, um, is a situation that we don't need to put most women in. And any of the above can be emotionally devastating, I think. The, the diagnosis of an unintended pregnancy can be heart-wrenching for anyone, and then you add on that um, someone who's going through chemotherapy or who um, maybe recently finished chemotherapy but who we've recommended does not get pregnant can be a, an additional emotional burden. So depending on what their primary cancer is, that may affect um, what contraceptive options they have, whether or not the cancer is hormonally me mediated, if she's currently go undergoing treatment, or if she is a cancer survivor status post-treatment, um, what her and her par partner's needs are, and I, you know, all of the options should be tailored to, to those answers. Um, just a little bit of information. So breast cancer is one of the cancers that we have the most information about when it comes to contraception. Um, the recommendation for pregnancy and breast cancer survivors is that they don't get pregnant for at least three years after cancer treatment. Um, and the hormones that are uh, related to pregnancy can increase the chance of recurrence. So that's where that recommendation comes from. Um, they're also not recom they're recommended to avoid any exogenous systemic estrogen and progestin um, due to a possible increased recurrence risk. Um, estrogen and progestin receptor status can affect prognosis and um, growth. Estrogen receptor blockade, we know, is a key component of breast cancer treatment. But we don't have great data on the extent to which estrogen-containing contraceptives um, may increase the likelihood of breast cancer recurrence. It's a little bit of a theoretical concern. There's some population-based studies, but we don't even have a, a good numbers to be able to quote women um, if, um, if they wanted to know. What about progestins, the other female hormone that's in a lot of contraceptions? Understudied in pre- and postmenopausal women, um, we do have systemic progestin-containing contraceptives, including the levonorgestrel IUS and the progestin-only implant. There's some animal studies that show progestins induce growth and metastasis in, in breast cancer, and for, for that reason, um, progestin-containing contraceptives are not advised for women with a prior diagnosis of cancer. Uh, breast cancer. But on the other hand, we know that oral um, medroxy progesterone acetate has some benefits as a chemotherapy agent. So it, I think in the end, we think that this is, um, again, something that's understudied and that we don't fully understand. Um, and when you look at the general population, progestin-only contraceptives are not associated with an increased risk of breast cancer. So right now, the preferred contraceptive for women with breast cancer, given these controversies about hormones, is the copper T380 or Paragard. Um, the good news is it's one of the most effective forms of birth control. It's, in, um, it's also 100% reversible and only lasts as long as it's in. Um, and additional studies are really needed to evaluate the, sa the safety of progestins um, in hormonally sensitive um, patients with breast cancer to know whether or not this is a, a reasonable option for them. So tamoxifen, one of the um, uh, mainstays of breast cancer treatment can cause endometrial proliferation and endometrial cancer, and so the levonorgestrel IUS may be an optimal form of contraception for them. Um, it has contraceptive benefits and endometrial benefits because it thins the lining of the uterus, um, and so it might also decrease the annoying um, frequent evaluation that women on tamoxifen often have to undergo because they have intermittent vaginal bleeding. Um, there are several studies that show no higher risk of, of breast cancer recurrence with the levonorgestrel IUS um, when it's being used during tamoxifen treatment, and one very small subgroup analysis that showed who women who had the IUS in um, at the time of their diagnosis and continued it may have had um, and may have an increased risk. And so again, more research is needed. 
Um, I think the risk of uh, venous thromboembolism is something that's on the concern of a lot, on the mind of a lot of oncologists. We know that cancer and estrogen are both independent risk factors for VTE. Um, and so combined hormonal contraceptives should be avoided in women with active cancer and in women with the history of cancer treatment in the last three months. They're both category four in the CDC medical eligibility criteria. Progestin-only contraceptives, we, the CDC and we, the Society of Family Planning, believe that the benefits outweigh the perceived risk. Um, so it's listed as a category two. Um, and that the increased risk of VTE, if it does exist, is much less than it is with estrogen-containing um, products. Um, and so the summary point there is that available data do not show that progestin-only contraceptives increase the risk of VTE. The other thing to consider is what side effects women are experiencing due to their therapy. And so anemia being a common um, side effect of a lot of cancers or their therapies, um, there are menstrual benefits of a lot of contraceptions, which could dramatically increase someone's quality of life. And so the levonorgestrel IUS um, may be used to minimize menstrual blood loss. Um, and then the copper, oh, my arrow fell. Um, so the copper T380 um, does increase menses in some women. So if you're trying to help her anemia by decreasing her menstrual blood loss every month, if she's if she is menstruating, then um, the levonorgestrel is probably a better uh, better choice for that than the Paragard. Um, osteoporosis. The current recommendation is to avoid injectable progestin-only contraceptions in someone with osteopenia or oste osteoporosis um, because injectable depoproduximogesterone acetate has been shown to um, increase the risk of osteopenia and osteoporosis. It is reversible at the time that um, the bone loss or the, or the bone thinning is reversible when someone gets taken off the depo, um, but for right now we don't feel like the, the, we feel that the risks are greater than the benefit. Immunosuppression, that's why we did the little two slides before about IUDs being safe to use. And then the history of chest wall radiation. Um, women who've had a previous history have um, an increased risk of breast cancer. And so the recommendation is to avoid the potential risk of exogenous estrogen and progestin. I think um, the, all of you in the room are very good at organizing multidisciplinary care for your patients um, to meet their needs. and. I want you to know that I'm also here to be a part of your care team. Um, and that just like my colleagues who are helping people get pregnant in reproductive endocrinology and infertility and maternal fetal medicine or high risk obstetrics are taking care of patients when they continue pregnancy, me and my partner, Dr. Nancy Stanwood, are also here to help you for women who do not want to become pregnant and to work with you to, to develop um, an individual, individual recommendations and plan of care based on what your recommendations are regarding her cancer and what her needs are regarding her contraceptive needs. This is um, who we are. We're Yale Family Planning, so we're part of the Department of OB-GYN. It's myself and another uh, fellowship-trained obstetrician-gynecologist. Um, we will see your patients. We'll see you. We'll see your partners. Again, if you don't want to be pregnant, we want to help. I think the take home message here is that there are a lot of different methods for prevention of unintended pregnancy and that we need to talk about this and assess this with our patients, um, or at least send them to me. Because um, as you know, I have no qualms about um, talking about this. And there is an opportunity, I think, for multidisciplinary care here um, so that we can take great care of women and that the risks of contraception always have to be weighed against the risk of pregnancy, which are also um, considerable. Oh, and that was if anyone wanted to know that. Okay. I'd be happy to take any questions. Questions? Gil? Uh, you know, this has been very uh, um, challenging because one of the concepts that always we have uh, with uh, patients with cancer is the opposite. We have been trying to develop methods to preserve fertility in those patients. So for me, it has been very illuminating this and the aspect. My question to you is, and I would like to learn more, what do you know about the type of chemotherapy that is not having the classical effect that I'm familiar with, mm -hmm. that is the destruction of the oocytes, the destruction of the ovary, and so on, which leads to the lack of uh, fertility. Mm -hmm. Is known about what type of chemotherapy doesn't have that effect? Which one are the women who really chemotherapy will not affect their fertility? I don't, I think that's a great question. Um, it, did everyone hear? It's good, because I don't know that I could summarize all of it. Um, <laughs> but the, the idea of, do we need to look specifically at the chemotherapeutic agent to see um, which one of those don't destroy the ova 
um, and therefore which women are at risk of, un, of unintended pregnancy. And also that we have spent a lot of time over the last few years, I think, talking about um, preserving fertility in, in women with cancer. And so to take that second one first, um, yes, we should reserve fertility in women with cancer and then help them get pregnant when they want to be and not expose them to unintended pregnancy when they don't want to be. And I think the issue of we know that chemotherapy decreases fertility and that's why we're so concerned ab about it. And I think we've done a really good job of messaging that for for patients saying that like, if you go through chemo, you might, um, you might have trouble getting pregnant down the line. Let's talk about where your options are for um, frozen embryos or for frozen eggs. But having a decreased risk of pregnancy does not mean a negligible risk of pregnancy. And so just like, I mean, endo endometrial ablation is something we do. We tell people like, you really shouldn't plan to get pregnant. It's risky um, to get pregnant after you have one of those. Um, so don't plan on getting pregnant because um, you probably wouldn't be able to get pregnant. That women hear that as I can't get pregnant. And so then they come in saying, well, all they were doing was talking to me about how I might not be able to get pregnant or I shouldn't plan on getting pregnant. And so I didn't think I needed to use contraception. Um, so I think that, that all of the above is what's true. And that um, maybe, uh, you know, from my side of the table, because that's who I take care of, we haven't been doing a good enough job with the, with the contraceptive piece. Okay, I think we're out of time. So let's thank the speaker and thank you all for coming.